um, prayer and repentance conference. You don't see these very often. We were repenting for the sins of the church, at least uh, part of the time. We had some speakers, Bob Bakke from Minneapolis, who's formerly head of the National Day of Prayer. Um, he has uh, led prayer movements all over the world. He's a, like a prayer statesman. Um, he and some others started the Global Day of Prayer, which, all, which is, by the way, May 15th, the Global Day of Prayer. Uh, we're not going to get into the data this year because we're too busy doing it. Just, but next year we will. But so this was um, an initiative by a former pastor of KPC, Frank Costenbader, who's part of a foundation in Texas, in Austin, Texas. Yeah, go Texas. Uh, I used to live down there. And they brought together Bob Aki, uh, Jennifer LeClaire, who's from Charisma Magazine, uh, Rick Curry, who's the guy who got the big dream about the flag. I don't know if you've read about that. Dutch Sheets um, was in the dream. Dutch has got a book out called Appeal to Heaven. And Jennifer LeClaire's got a book out, What the Future Holds for America or something, all about the flag. But basically, God is um, pointing to this flag as a kind of a rallying point to say if people would appeal to heaven, he will answer like he did. You know, George Washington had this flag designed in 1775. And he flew it above the 11 sh naval ships that he purchased, because there was no US Navy. He flew it from the mast to remind people that the only way we were going to beat the, the, the greatest navy in the world at that point, which was the British Navy, was by an appeal to heaven. And the British were blockading Boston so that no supplies could come in. They wanted the colonists in Boston to <coughs> surrender. And so they had a British blockade, which was, at that point, impenetrable except for the grace of God. So he had these flags put on 11 ships that he purchased and they broke the blockade. It was a miracle how they did it. So the state of Massachusetts adopted it as its state flag for a while and almost became the US flag. Um, so it's a very, uh, how many did not, how, we didn't know about that in history class, did we? Nobody told us about this. But you go to the Naval Archives website and they'll tell you, they'll tell you all about it. It's part of naval history, U.S. naval history. So Rick Curry was there. He's just, Rick's like a revivalist. He just has things happen to him. He has stories about God doing crazy things in his life are just almost unbelievable. In fact, he had one at the first landing cross on Saturday. We went down that Saturday morning to pray. And he ran into a couple of ladies from Maryland with flags. And they said that the Lord sent them there to meet a man. And they were to give that man a message. And Rick happened to be standing there on the platform when we looked in the ocean. He says, well, you're here. You must be the man. And they said, the, the message is, the appeal to heaven has been heard. And now God is releasing uh, revival, awesome. awakening. Yeah. And, and he said, uh, where would you hear that at? Oh, I said, well, it's in that book about the flag with Dutch sheets and all that. Some guy had a dream, and he says, well, do you know who that guy was? And they said, no, he said, it was me. <laughs> and that's, that, that's a little weird. That's a little weird. I mean, if that weird is the Lord. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that crazy or what? They didn't know who he was, and they gave him the message. So he calls Dutch Cheech right away and says, Dutch, guess what? These ladies... Yeah, I said that the appeals for her. So it was it was it was a wonderful time. Uh, I got to speak twice on on the stuff in my book, you know, healing America's DNA. And Saturday morning was the highlight when we had a, a about six or eight Africans from who were born and raised in Africa. Billy Bim, well, Billy Bimba wasn't there, but some other people you wouldn't know, but that, that I know. And we had me and Marty O'Rourke, who's an Anglican priest over here, and a bunch of other um, uh, descendants. Michael and others, uh, white people, we apologized to the African Amer to the Africans for uh, starting the slave trade and the slave industry here in Virginia in 1619 at Yorktown. You know, the first 90 slaves were brought in and sold to the uh, colonists uh, for tobacco. Uh, tobacco was the whole. The reason this, they wanted slaves was just so that they could have cheap labor to grow more tobacco. That's they weren't. We didn't do slavery for racist reasons. We did it just to make money. The greatest sin of the colony and of America is that we have allowed the love of money to corrupt us to the point where we're willing to do things that we know we shouldn't do, but we do them for money. And even in the church, the church does things for money that it shouldn't do. Like, it doesn't talk about abortion. 
It doesn't talk about sin. It doesn't pray. Uh, it doesn't do... They, anyhow, money has corrupted um, the church in many ways. And so we, we at least apologize to them. And it was just a very moving time. We're crying, they're crying. And, uh, they, and then they spoke words of forgiveness to us. It's a beautiful... There was a moment of... Like, it's called identificational repentance. Have you heard of that? Uh, it's in the book. Um, basically, you're asking for forgiveness of your ancestors' sins. And that's a biblical pattern in the Old Testament. It was done in Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, and Daniel 9. And it's talked about in several other places in the Old Testament where they did that. If you read 2 Samuel 21, and that's the clearest illustration of, the, of what good can come from identificational repentance. But I'm not here to talk about all that today. I'm here to talk about our new theme. So each month we've been having a different theme about the kingdom of God. January's theme was what? The kingdom of God. So we just introduced the kingdom of God. We've prayed all for years, you know, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In the Lord's prayer. That's the model prayer, Jesus' prayer. And part of it is, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And I prayed that for 50 years and never really knew what I was praying for, in a way. I'm like, what does that look like? How do I know? Of course, when Jesus comes at the end of time, we, that, that's certainly the kingdom coming. But in between there, here and there, what does it look like? So we try to describe it in some subtopics. So in, Jan in February, we talked about the kingdom comes in physical healing. Jesus uh, said to this one person, he says, it, uh, he cast a demon out. He says, if I cast this demon out by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Oh yeah, I forgot the offering. I'll do that a second. <laughs> so the kingdom of God has come upon you. Get ready. Uh, so a demonstration of, of God's power to heal, to deliver, is a demonstration of the kingdom. The kingdom is a kingdom of, of, of health. It's a kingdom of where there is no darkness, no sin, and, and no, none of the effects of sin. One of which would be physical, physical sickness or demonic uh, oppression, that kind of thing. So the kingdom came with... Physical healing. The second week um, of March, we did the kingdom comes with emotional healing. Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free. He came to make you emotionally well. He came to fill you with his joy and his peace that passes understanding. People who are experiencing the kingdom are happy people. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you are not sad. You are not depressed. You are not fearful. You are not angry. You are the opposite of all of that. So that the, when the kingdom comes, just like on Pentecost, they're like, wah! They're free, man. They're, they're, they don't care if people are making fun of them. They're, they're having a blast doing whatever the Holy Spirit's doing on them. And, they're, and then they're, they give away all their stuff to each other and share with one another. They're free. They're, they're not fearful. They're not selfish. They're, they're, they're emotionally... It's an emotional high. Not that you're like giddy all the time, but... There's a joy, a river of joy, a river of life, a river of peace flowing in you when the kingdom is uh, alive in you. And that's what Jesus came to, to bring, to, to turn their sadness into dancing. And then um, in April, uh, so uh, what did we talk In April it was uh, personal, personal revelation. Personal revelation, yeah, I got, um, I'm tired. Um, it was a bit busy weekend. Kingdom comes with personal revelation. Jesus came to distribute revelation from the Holy Spirit to every Christian just because in the Old Testament it was only kings, priests, and prophets that got revelation. But now everybody, according to Joel 2.28, you know, he pours out his spirit upon all flesh. And it says, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will dream visions. It's all about revelation. God communicating uh, thoughts and ideas and truth from heaven down to every person. So this month it's the kingdom comes for evangelism. Um, the kingdom comes to um, get people to heaven. I mean, that's kind of self-evident, isn't it? Jesus came to, as the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world so that they could go to heaven. But uh, the kingdom comes to mobilize us to do, to get people to heaven. That's kind of what I want to. But, we're partners with Jesus in that. Now, many of you are missionaries or former missionaries and have tried all kinds of evangelistic things. Um, what was Kennedy's thing? Um, 
and you know, uh, huh? evangelism explosion. And, yeah, there's all kinds of methods out there. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about uh, in this series is not so much the methods, it's the motivation, um, the responsibility to be a witness, I guess. There's five billion people on earth. If they had the chance to sit down and have coffee with you, any one of you could probably share with them information that could change their life for all eternity. Any one of you. Jonathan could change their life. Caleb. Anyone who knows the Lord could share with them the simple truth. If all you knew was John 3.16. Dad's got a set of dog tags back there. On his, I just got him. So in case you know he gets falls or hurt, the dog tag will tell people who to call. And on the flip side of it, though, is John 3.16. For God, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have life. Oh yeah, all right. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have life everlasting. Just testing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. You caught that. <laughs> that's good. You caught that. Because, you know, God's depending upon you to know that. If you don't know John 3.16 by heart, and if, please memorize it. If you, could, if you sat down with a guy in Tibet, or a guy from Bhutan, or a guy from Sierra Leone, or a guy from anywhere, or a gal, and just told him that. For God so loved you that... He did not want you to perish, but he gave his own, he sent his only son so that if you believe in him, you could have eternal life. You wouldn't have to perish. If you just know that, that's the gospel. That's the good news. You don't have to die for your sins. You can go to heaven through faith in Jesus. You can do that in the elevator in Kuala Lumpur. You can do that as you enter the mosque, the great mosque in, in Istanbul to somebody. You could do that on the subway in London. You could do that on a boat in, in Hong Kong. A water ferry. You could do it anywhere. You could do it in Farm Fresh in the line while you're getting ready to pay your pay your bill. You could tell people that the contents of that verse, and if they haven't heard it, and if God has prepared their heart, and especially if people are praying for Him, God will have prepared their heart. It could turn on a light, and that light could change them from death to life forever. There, we have two doctors here. We have people who do very honorable kinds of work. They help people. Blah blah blah. But there is no greater privilege than changing somebody's eternal destination. No greater privilege. When you get to heaven, I guarantee you, you're going to wish that you had told more people. Old men regret what they didn't do. Young men regret what they did do. When you're old and you're, and you're in the halls of heaven, you're going to think about all the people you could have told that aren't there. And I'm not saying you'll be sad for a long time, but it'll, it'll strike you. You may even see the last judgment where some of your neighbors come, stand before, before God, and, and you may think, wow, I forgot to tell him. I forgot to tell her. I forgot to even pray for them. Not to put you on a guilt trip, but this is the reality, that God's only plan to get your neighbors to heaven, to get people around the world to heaven, is to what we do to pray for them and to, t and to tell them the gospel. It's that simple. Um, everybody's got a, sort of a field, you know, that where we can sow the seed of the gospel. Get your family's the field, your friends are the field, your neighbors are the field. Um, and the gospel is the only way they're going to get to heaven. They can't be good enough. They can't be sincere enough. <laughs> like peanuts. How did we lose the game? We were so sincere. You know, the, the baseball game. How did we lose that game? We were so sincere. Sincerity won't do it, won't, won't hack it. Some people really believe that because they're a good person, they're going to get to heaven. Well, if that were true, then why would God send Jesus? Why wouldn't you just say, well, just be good? You know? Why would I send my only son to die a horrible death if, you're, if your sincerity and good intentions were enough? But even a lot of Christians think that, or people who think they're Christians think that. They don't get it that they can't get to heaven without Jesus, basically. And you'll make people mad telling them that. You'll offend people by that. 
Jesus said, if they, the whole world will hate you on account of my name. And why would that be? Because it's an exclusivity that, that offends people. Well, wait a minute, I'm a good Muslim, I'm a good Buddhist, I'm a good atheist, I give money to the poor, I'm a philanthropist, I haven't committed adultery, I haven't killed anybody, you know, I've been a good guy, I've been nice to my wife and kids, blah, blah, blah. And, and, but that's, it's not good enough from God's standpoint. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And one of the sins that you've committed, if you've never committed any like major sins, is you haven't loved God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's the great commandment. So all those people don't know Jesus, they, how are they going to love God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind? They're already that eh, that sin one, right there. Uh, they're loving themselves or they're loving something else, but they're not loving God. So, so they're, they're excluded from heaven forever because of that one sin. So it's our greatest privilege and it's, a, and it's a real responsibility to be a Christian, to be a witness. It doesn't mean you have to be an evangelist. doesn't mean you have to stand on the street corner or whatever you think that means. It means that your life should communicate that Jesus is real and that, um, and that the Bible is true and that uh, God, God's a good God. Your life should transmit that by your actions, your words, by how you spend your time, energy, and money. If you want to know what a person believes, look at his checkbook, look at his calendar. That sounds bad. Does your calendar and your checkbook and the way you spend your time reflect the fact that you're a Christian? If they were going to, you know, you've heard that thing, if, if they came and arrested everybody and they were going to convict him and send him to the jail if they're a Christian, would, it, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Yeah. <laughs> For some Christians, that, that's, a, you know, that's a hard question. That they'd be hard to convict them. Um, or uh, would your would your life change any if you stopped believing in God? Right. Would your life change any if you stop believe if you said you stopped believing in God? Right. Um, I think t I think Christianity in America is very lukewarm. I think that we have been put to sleep by a low level version of Christianity that has uh, been punctuated by times of revival times of uh, spiritual awakening in America, but I think people tend to, to live a life that's uh, mediocre, lukewarm, and kind of, um, you know, they use God to help them have a nice life, but, but God really isn't the center of their life. So there's always a tension there. You've got to take care of your kids, got to pay the bills, you've got to mow the lawn, you've got to keep the car going, you've got to, you've got to do a lot of things. So. We are always in danger of being third soil Christians, where this, the seed goes into the soil, but it's choked out by the cares and worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Riches, the focus on money and what money buys, Jesus um, contrasted with the love of God. He said, you, you can only serve one or the other. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money, but you can't have two masters. So money can be a master easily. And without it, you thinking you're obeying it, you just live your life based around making money and using money to do what you need to do. Instead of, okay, I I'm, I'm really want to live my life focused on God and what God wants, as Butler said the other day. So when I go to the store, yeah, I've got to buy stuff with money, but my real goal is how can I be a witness in this store for Jesus? How can I represent him well? How can I love somebody? Maybe there's somebody there who's counting out their pennies to buy something. Why don't I just go up and pay it for them? Or how can I help a lady carry her groceries out of the car? Or whatever, it, it comes to your mind. Or, or maybe just say to the, to the person in front of you, say, uh, hi, are you, are you local? Yeah. You go to a church? No. I don't. I say, well, do you know that God has his eye on you because he, he's always loved you? Do you know that he wants you to come to heaven and be his child? I mean, you make up your own words. Or if not, you know, we can give you a little script if you want. That'll help you to kind of kickstart things. But... Just to say something, is that risky? Can you, can, can you be snubbed? Can you be uh, ridiculed for that? You betcha. It happened to me lots. Um, and that's why I encourage people to learn how to pray for the sick. Because when we pray for the sick, or give them a prophetic word or something like that, they're much more inclined to, to listen up and say, Oh, wow, I feel better. Who is, what'd you just do there? You know? And, and so that's why Joel and Lacey go <coughs> around the world, and, and they... Hundreds, if not thousands, of people come to the Lord every year when they're ministering because they experience the power of God through healing and revelation. So, um, you know, what I'm telling you is anti-cultural. 
uh, even in, within the, the American church. It's not, this is not stuff that is popular. I think the American church, in many ways, is very deceived about how to live a Christian life. I really think it's, they've kind of made it all about living a happy, comfortable, Christian suburban life, instead of kind of the more radical viewpoint of, you know, we're here just for a little time. A small gleam of time twitched to eternities, as the poet says so that we can become more like Jesus, we can grow up to be more like the Lord, and so that we can get more people to heaven. For me, it's just it's those two things. Yes, I've got to mow the lawn, pay my uh, mortgage, and I've got to do all these other things, but it's really about living from the perspective of eternity. So that when I die and go to heaven, or, when, or Jesus, I think Jesus is going to come back before then, and we're just going to you know, do the elevator thing in the air, that I won't have to stand before him with much regret so that I can say, okay, I didn't get pray for this person or me. I didn't tell that person, but I did do it to a lot of other people. I loved them well. I was an example to them of, of a godly life. I tried to serve them. I tried to show them and tell them that, uh, that beyond this life, they can be in heaven with Jesus. They can have a hope beyond the grave. They're all going to die. We're all going to die. So what do we... So we're here just for 80 years, plus or minus 20. What does our life stand for? What, what does it mean? What's our purpose? And I want to encourage you as your brother, as your pastor, to keep your focus from the perspective of heaven. When you're up in heaven and you think about your life on earth, are you going to feel good that you, that you did your best, your level best, obviously, you're not perfect, to make sure that as many people that you could come in contact with, you help them to get to heaven. You pray for them, you serve them, you to show them the love of God in a practical way maybe, take them cookies or something. Like when new people come into the neighborhood, take them cookies, be nice to them. When people are mean to you in the neighborhood and the neighbors are talking about you, take them cookies. Return good for evil and they'll say, whoa, why does that person do that? They'll make them think, well, and they say, why did you do that? Well, because Jesus has given me a love for you. And I know I've offended you. I know that I've done something you didn't like. But um, I can't help but love you. And I'm commanded to love you. You're weird. But they like the weird. They like it when people are good to them after they've been mean to you. It's, it's, it's one of the best ways to witness to somebody. If you've got somebody that's upset with you, you've got a great opportunity to show them to witness to them, just by being nice to them in return. I don't need to tell you the stories I've told them so many times about Graham Staines. Does that name ring a bell? You should know the name Graham Staines. He was a missionary to India. He and his two sons worked among lepers, and his family were among lepers for 30 years, and one day the Hindu radicals uh, poured gasoline on their, on their jeep there in the city square and burned them alive. And the father and the two sons cheering around the car as the flames were going up. And so it was a hideous crime that made the newspapers all across India. But the very next day, what stunned India even more was Mrs. Stain saying, we forgive. The Hindus did, didn't know what to do with that. It just, it just blew them off, their, off their, their chairs. We forgive. Same thing happened in, in Turkey. Uh, Tom Blackstone, a friend of ours, worked over there. There's a town in Turkey where three Turkish missionaries uh, took in these uh, Muslims who thought, who said they were interested in Jesus, took them into the office, and the Muslims tied up the missionaries and, and um, brutally killed them, <coughs> tortured them, killed them. And again, in a day or two in the newspapers, the three wives said, we forgive. It stunned Turkey. They're, they don't hardly have a word in the, in the language for forgiveness. In, uh, in Islam, forgiveness is not a concept that's very common. Um, I told you about uh, Dini, who was a man who worked at CBN in the, uh, in the, in the what do you call it, department, custodial department. He was a former Muslim from Albania. And he's a Christian, good guy, Dini. But yeah, he, uh, he said that when um, his sister got married, to some guy when they were Muslims, and they're at, after the, at the wedding celebration afterwards, the father comes up and says to the to the to the groom, 
the, the new son-in-law says, see this bullet? This is what I will kill you with if you dishonor my daughter mm -hmm. at the wedding reception. So that's the culture. <laughs> that, you know, that there's a shame-based cultures. There are often violent cultures. And, and so um, Christians are called to be different. Christians are called to, to, to love like Jesus loved. To love people that didn't deserve love. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. All that. Um, we'll do the offering at the end. Um, don't we forget. <laughs> we'll do the offering. Um, I have uh, probably embarrassed some of you in talking about my my own personal burden for the lost in the past. I, mean, I, I cry easily over this um, because. It's just a revelation I got as a little boy. I was going to be a missionary since a little boy. And um, when I walk into a room, I tend to think about, well, who's going to make it into a restaurant? Who's going to make it? Who, who has made it? Who's going to make it? That's, that's, my, that's how I, grit, that's how I um, classify people. They're going to make it. They're not going to make it. And by that, by that I mean they're going to make it to heaven. Because if the world blew up right now, about five billion people at least would not make it. Many of them in America. And so it's a burden for me. It's like I'm walking along the seashore and all these people uh, 10 yards off the shore are drowning. Or the sharks are getting them or something. And I've got armfuls of life preservers. And I'm walking along. Yeah. And, and they're all drowning. And so what should I do? Should I just drop them and go back and you know, get a hot dog at the, at the hot dog stand? Is yeah. that what I should do? Or should I like start throwing life preservers to them? Call 911 or something. You should do something. I, I, I know that you don't feel that way, but I, but I have felt that way for uh, my life, practically. It's a burden I have. And what, it's very frustrating to me that I've led so few, few people to the Lord. I don't know if you've ever led anybody to the Lord that you know of. I mean, you've probably led people to the Lord you don't know, but I have personally know of only half a dozen, uh, dozen max people in my whole life that have ever led to the Lord. And I feel so badly about that. Um, but I'm convinced that we together can win more people to the Lord if we pray for them. Because prayer does two things. It changes us and it changes them. Why would God say... Well, Jesus prayed uh, a lot, <laughs> and uh, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit prays for us, and Jesus prays for us. Um, one of the reasons we need to pray, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 4, is that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. There are blinders, there are spiritual filters, or not unbelievers' eyes, they can't see. So you need to pray that God would supernaturally take those things off their eyes. They can't see. Is anybody here reading uh, John chapter 9 this, this week? All right, just like two or three of you, that's good. The rest of you are illiterates. Uh, no, you've already got it memorized, I know that. All right, so, no, I really, really, read the Bible, please. If, if you want to stay focused, stay on target, read the Bible. And we've got a new sheet back there for uh, May and June. But I was reading in John 9, I think it was 9, it fit right into this. Um, all right, I wrote it down. I'm sorry, John 8, 42. Go to John 8, 42. So Jesus says, uh, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come from God, and now I am here. I have not come on my own, but he has sent me. And then he says this very interesting thing, which I hadn't really noticed before. Why is my language not clear to you? Why aren't you getting this? Here I am. I'm the Son of God. I'm talking to you, and you're not getting it. Because you are unable to hear what I say. Well, why is that? Because you belong to your father, the devil. Now, there's a real good, if you want to get, you know, draw a crowd. You're all of the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, where there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. Wow. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So people can't hear because they, they have been captivated. Their minds have been captivated. They have these blinders on from the devil. Jesus is, even says that here. He understands why people can't hear. 
one of the ways you can influence people is by praying for them. I mean, that's why we pray. God answers prayer. So in order for people to hear, we have to pray for them. I have rarely heard of people being saved uh, if they hadn't been prayed for by somebody. I guess it can't happen. But when you get to heaven, try to find out who prayed for you. Yeah. You know who prayed for you, Linda? Your grandmother, yeah. Who prayed for you? Your mother, yeah. Yeah. Everybody here is here in the kingdom because somebody prayed for you, most likely. So, wouldn't you like to do that for somebody else? For your family, obviously. I know you're all praying for your family. I, I pray for my, my brother Jim for... Well, I prayed for him probably for at least 30 years, and he wasn't getting saved, and I was in agony about it, and I was asking people, you know, what am I doing wrong, or how can I get him to heaven, or whatever, and I, I, they, they, there were no answers, they just said keep praying, and so finally one day, maybe at 35 years, the Lord just gave me an assurance that he was going to save my brother Jim. Yeah, and you'll hopefully meet Jim, I'm going to try to bring him down from Roanoke, where he's in a, a veteran's home. He's in a wheelchair. We'll wheel him in here, hopefully someday, and you'll meet him. But um, he uh, got involved. He, he turned away from God as a young boy for because he, he didn't understand a lot of things. He was confused, and he he, he actually said, he, "I tried, I tried the Catholic God, and it didn't work. So I asked the devil to help me." Oh. You know, a lot of people have done that. <laughs> They turned away from God because some Christian was mean to them, or they went to a church and they were abused, or, or, or they were just ignored. And so they turned to evil, and even to evil beings. So, uh, we, so they need prayer. So anyhow, God has assured me that Jim's going to be saved. He's going to be in heaven with Dad and I and, and our family. Um, so I know you're praying for your, your family. I, I'm sure some of you are praying for your neighbors. Let me read an example of what happened to this uh, one family. They decided that they would make a commitment to pray for their neighbors. Have you ever done that? Pray for your neighbors? Like, over and over again? Okay. So, a Christian family in the United States accepted the challenge of praying for their neighbors as they prayed over eight weeks for five neighboring families. Remarkable things happened. A young man from one of the homes approached the husband of the family and asked for help to get out of dealing with drugs. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. A young girl came with questions about Christianity and gave her life to Christ and started to go to church. A Hispanic family with two children asked to have a Bible study and ended up all four of them trusting Christ. A Buddhist family from across the street asked to go to church with them. And soon God began to draw them to himself and touch their lives in gracious ways. And all of this happened after that one family started to make a commitment to praying for their for these five families. So you don't have to be a missionary to go overseas in a sense. I mean, your, 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 your neighborhood is your mission field, part of your mission field. Acts 17, 26, you ever heard that verse? Where God has determined the, the, the time and place where each person is to live. Yeah. You live where you live because God led you there. Not your realtor. Not just because you thought that God sovereignly led you to live where you live. And so, and you're called. You all know you're called to be a witness. So the people around you, why wouldn't God want you to pray for them on a regular basis? I've done this for years and years, and I, I've just, I haven't seen... People come to the Lord, but, but I've been faithful to do it. Prayer walk my neighborhoods for years and years, wherever, wherever I've lived. I know it's pleased the Lord, and I believe it's had a, but I haven't been able to gather in the harvest yet. I'm not a very good personal evangelist, I, I guess. I, I, that's why I want signs and wonders. I think if, when God breaks out, they'll get it. Or maybe you're a sower, Bob. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I'm a sower. Like, you're not a <laughs> well, I, I am definitely a sower. You don't see the, the I don't, the yeah. Maybe somebody else is supposed to read. I should like to read a little. But, um, <laughs> that was I mean, really, I mean, the sower, you know, sh should, should at least see the harvest. Um, so, but, um, but I want you to have 
some of the burden that I have. I want you to have some of the vision for your life that I have. That you're only here for a short while. I can I, I think I have two hundred and some months left. Oh really? Can't if I were to die at ninety, I'd have two hundred and some months left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean you all could count it out. If you're all if if you're gonna live to be ninety, how many months would that be? So it 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 says it says in, in the Bible to uh, take account of your days. You know, the day, life is a, like a fleeting thing. You know, you're here today, gone tomorrow. But the word of the Lord endures forever. So, and, and the other thing endures forever is people. They endure forever, either in hell or in heaven. So, wouldn't I tell you when you get to heaven, the thing that will make you most happy is that your family's there. Well, God's there. Then your family and the people that you help to get to heaven. That's going to be your greatest source of joy. Not the fact that you you made a million bucks. Uh, not the fact that you had the prettiest house or garden or the, or the most wonderful business or whatever like that. I mean, that, that'll seem like nothing compared to the fact that the people in, up there with you, you helped to get them there because you loved them, you prayed for them, you witnessed to them. Um, so... That's probably enough. Uh, so, I'd like your help. Um, I'd like you to help me figure out how we're going to pray. In, I know you're going to pray individually for this, but how we can pray as a church uh, for the lost. How can we get together? And Skype, phone, in, in person would be best, but I know that you're all busy and you're tired. Uh, at, you know, whatever. Whatever. <coughs> combination of those things, it's difficult for us to physically get together. But I'd be willing to um, get together with you if we could pray on a regular basis for people to be saved. We pray for a lot of individual things. In fact, Mark um, has a friend at Norfolk General who's about to die this week. They're going to pull the plug if he doesn't get healed. A man in his 40s. Hmm? Today. Today they're going to pull the one? Oh. Wow. He's, he went to a hospital for just a normal operation and got one of those incurable infections. Hospital infections. What's his first name? Mike. Mike. Well, um, if Mike's willing, I'd be willing to go over and visit him and pray for him. So Mike's, does Mike know the Lord? I don't know. Yeah. So Mike's on the edge of eternity. He may he may go to heaven, but he may not. So doesn't your heart go out to Mike? Yeah, for sure. He's got hours to live. If they pull that plug, they don't live very long. So we're gonna pray for Mike, but if we could get together and pray for uh, for God's heart to be expressed to the community in whatever way he wants it, through acts of service. Through, through witnessing, like we're going to go do on, on the 15th, whatever, more people would be drawn to the Lord, more people would get saved. I'm, I have to believe that because of what the scriptures say. I haven't had time to go into all the scriptures, but the people in the Bible prayed, and it made a difference. Um, there's more examples I could read to you, but I think that's enough. Prayer changes people. Prayer changes us. Prayer. Je Jesus said, the harvest is ripe. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send workers into the harvest. If all we did was pray that really well, that would be we'd be answering the direct request of Jesus. And you know what? If you pray it long enough, you'll end up being one of those workers. You'll end up being sent to your neighbor, to your family, to somebody. You'll end up saying, well, Lord, here I am. Send me. <coughs> Because your heart will be changed by God for the lost. I realize I can't talk to any this. I can't talk to anybody into this. I've tried for years and years. If God doesn't change your heart on this, it's not going to happen. I realize that. So I'm not going to try to twist anybody's arm or try to guilt them into this or, or uh, whatever. It, I got it by revelation. It's not because I'm better than you. I just got it by revelation as a as a kid that people need the Lord. That's a great song, by the way. Yeah, I could, I'm not sure I could sing without crying. Oh. I had a situation about 10 years ago. 
I had a situation about 10 years ago where uh, a man came to me from another church that I didn't, I knew him from the pastor's conferences and all, but I, did, I, I didn't know his church or his members or anything else. He said, I have a, a mother and a sister who have a, a son and a brother who's dying in the Virginia Beach General of AIDS. And uh, he doesn't have two or three days at most to live. And he hates God. He wants nobody to talk to him about God. And can you please come and pray? And I say this, that God prepares the way. I got there. The mother and sister are there. And he's there, laying there. It, it, it was, I won't even go into circumstances of what he looked like and what was going on, but I just simply asked him, you're facing eternity. Would you like to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that God is with you as you and he looked at me and said, yes. <laughs> we prayed the sinner's prayer and he died the next morning. Mm -hmm. And the mother and sister were like, it was like a puddle of water over here on the floor where they were sitting. Amen. And uh, they said, I can't believe it. No, no, nobody. Mm -hmm. Everybody tried to come and pray with him. He wanted nothing to do with it. I said, God prepares the way. I didn't do anything. Right. I just asked a simple question. It wasn't because I had any great persuasive powers or abilities, mm -hmm. but it was the right time at the right moment. So, uh, I've had more than one deathbed experience like that. God does move. And when you see him in heaven, what's that going to be like? Wow. Well, <laughs> it'll be joy. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, I, uh, he's going to run to you and throw his arms around you. and Yeah. And for all eternity, he'll celebrate that. That God, you stepped in there just before you went over into the abyss and grabbed his hand and Pull him up. I want to say one more thing. Something that helped me on the streets. I had a street ministry for many <laughs> years where I was dealing with drug addicts, prostitutes, and all that. And, and the worst of the worst, drug pushers. And uh, I learned that uh, I would be very warm and personable, and I would just come up and say something, observe something, or if I knew them, I'd say something that used to get them in a good mood. And the Lord, instead of asking them, you know, would you like to do right with God and all of that, I just asked them, can I bless you? Mm 